Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very accomplished leader from Dubai, UAE, Mr. Bruno Bianchini. Bruno, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ashutosh, for having me here. This is a very big pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bruno is a sustainability coordinator with Google, and he's a sustainability master student uh, at Harvard University. So, Bruno, before we talk sustainability, tell me about your own journey in brief and what got you interested in the area of sustainability. Yeah, you know, this is a question that I usually like to answer because uh, because uh, uh, it ties back to uh, to my personal story. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, see, maybe a couple of points. Like first is that I uh, I grew up on a farm in the north of Italy. So to me, sustainability has always been there, meaning right. like, you know, I thought it would be a problem. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, but then, like, you know, in, in sustainability, we like to talk about tipping points. Yeah. So so the moments when a system moves from point A to point B. So mm-hmm. I can say that my, tip, my tipping point, for example, was in uh, 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, in that year, I crossed paths with an environmental activist who really opened my eyes uh, about the environmental cost caused by our diets and also modern agriculture. Mm-hmm. Monday, probably you know how uh, you know we load our soils with lots of fertilizers, yeah. tend to spray like you know fruit and vegetables with plenty of pesticides. Mm-hmm. We're cutting down forests, unfortunately, like you know to give space to uh, modern agriculture. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, to me, like you know, one for example of the very first documentaries that I watched and was extremely um, uh, critical was a uh, cowspiracy. Mm-hmm. Um, so the movie really speaks about, you know, the environmental impacts of the cattle industry mm. in the U.S. And it shows also how corrupt agriculture, unfortunately, has become. Mm-hmm. So for me, growing up in a farm, you know, it was it was kind of a shock, you know, because uh, uh, because, again, like, you know, I was very much isolated from all of the wrongdoing of industrial agriculture so mm. so that's how I got, let's say inspired and and that's Very when i interesting. and you know bruno you've done uh, your corp- your your studies in corporate finance and business administration how has this back- background influenced your approach to sustainability yeah thank you for this question i guess that's um my my academic background helped me, I would say, in two ways. The first is that it really shaped the way of how I approach sustainability today. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's very important to understand how companies tick. You know, yeah. this obviously helps me to push the sustainability agenda in a language that obviously businesses understand, mm-hmm. right? So, um, so there, are like, there are many that say like, you know, oh, you know, we need to abandon. Uh, capitalism, we need to rethink completely, you know, our economic structure. Mm. Uh, I don't disagree with that, but I also think that, like, you know, companies are such a big part of our world today and they're not going to go anywhere. So, again, being able to navigate that space with the right language, I think, is important. Mm. Uh, I feel that the second impact is maybe more personal. Uh, Studying corporate finance and and, and business in general made me uh, a realist. You know, Mm. I've learned to look for sustainable solutions that are not just good on paper, mm. but they're actually, you know, doable also for businesses. Mm. So Bruno, you are a, you're a sustainability coordinator at Google. How do you define sustainability and which areas do you focus on? Um, okay, so I'll give you maybe first the more academic um, yeah. answer to that, because I think it's it's good as a, as a ground. Um, uh Mind you, like, you know, the words of sustainability comes from Latin word, which is uh, sustinere, mm-hmm. uh, which means to sustain, which means to maintain, right? Um, uh, studies of sustainability mostly draw the definition uh, from what we call the concept of sustainable development, mm-hmm. right? Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply passionate, for example, uh, of, uh, or, or I studied a lot, for example, the very first speech in 1972 from Indira Gandhi, mm. uh, you know, uh, w- one of the very first conversations around uh, environmental impact. And, 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 and from that, like, you know, it stems a lot of the understanding that sustainability needs to meet the needs of the present right. without 
maximizing the ability of future generation mm. to meet their needs. Mm. Um, now, this is obviously a strong ground foundation to do mm. some good work. I personally like this definition, but I think it has a lot to do with how can we be less bad? Mm. Um, but I have a problem with that, right? Because mm. if you think about the global economy that keeps on growing, mm. doing less bad with something that keeps on growing is not going to do anything good, mm. right? So, so this is why most of my work and, and my definition of sustainability tends to be around regeneration. Mm. Yeah. So which means we need to enter into a relationship of reciprocity with Mother Earth. It mm. means that not only we can be less bad, but we can actually become regenerative agents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's when, that that's the nuance that I like to bring to the concept of sustainability. Very interesting. And Bruno, you know, you've been doing so much work on sustainability. It's a word that has now entered every corporate boardroom. And yet people don't understand. So I wanted to ask you, what are some misconceptions about sustainability that you have uh, seen in the corporate world and how would you dispel these? Yeah, thanks for this question. Um, mind you, I, th I think there are like so many misconceptions uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, perhaps there are a couple for me that are top of mind um, and, 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 and they're really like, you know, close to, you know, the ethics and the way that I work in this space. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one has to do with the fact that sustainability right now has become just a war against carbon emissions mm. uh, um, uh, but we know that there is much more than that yeah. you know like if you think about the loss of biodiversity if you think about the impact on the oceans if you think about uh deforestation if you think about water use right so carbon emissions and climate change mind you is extremely important mm. uh, but it is not the only thing mm. um uh, I like to uh, uh, I, I like to quote my my professor here mm -hmm. uh, says like you know uh, uh, imagine going to school and you have like you know ten subjects that you need to be ready for to mm -hmm. pass an exam mm -hmm. and then you go and you know you have these ten questions to answer and then you're ready to answer only to one question which is carbon emissions mm -hmm. how do you think you're gonna do how well do you think you're gonna score during mm -hmm. that exam. Yeah, so this is a little bit like, you know, my yeah. um, my issue. And, and again, there is this big misconception that sustainability is only carbon emissions, and that's not it. Hmm. Um, Very interesting. Uh, does it make sense, yeah? It must, absolutely. Um, and, you the, know, in, yeah. sorry, go ahead, please. Please go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, no, no, please, if you have another question, I'm okay. But like, you know, yeah. I have another misconception, which please. is, yeah. you know, to, to me, you know, I, I hear only, I hear companies talking about like, you know, sustainability efforts are only for large corporations. Mm. And again, I think it's a major misconception mm. uh, because in reality, small and medium sized companies mm. play an extremely clu crucial role in obviously driving sustainable practices. Mm. If you think about small companies, you think about agility, you think about innovation. And, and small companies are really capable of implementing sustainability solutions extremely fast and quickly you know so True. so again like sustainability is not only for the big companies i would say it's mostly for small business because this mm -hmm. is obviously what creates our economy right very interesting and you know bruno in your role at google you support companies in making smarter and more conscious business decisions can you share some insights into how you are supporting startups and smes yeah. Um, so, um, so perhaps I'll 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 take this uh, uh, the, the, this question in uh, uh, in in two ways. The yeah. first is that my my role specifically at Google uh, ties a lot uh, uh, into the space of education and how we advance uh, you know um, sustainability practices at an advertising industry level. Mm -hmm. um, what do I mean by that? Um, Obviously, sustainability can feel like quite daunting for many companies, right? Mm. And especially because there is lack of talent mm. today. So um, I'm a very strong advocate that education is definitely the first step. Mm. So what we did and what I did, for example, last year, we launched a program that was called Green at Google. Mm -hmm. uh, this program has the objective to reach our clients and our partners 
through a series of different workshops that stimulate mm. sustainability conversations. Mm. So we developed content around nine different topics, for example, sustainable marketing, waste, circularity, energy, and so on and so forth. Mm. Uh, uh, the objective there was to really sit down with our clients and say, hey, this is what we do. Mm. Yeah. What can you do? Right. Yeah. So uh, so this was like, you know, through a series of, of, of workshops. Mm. Uh, the other uh, important element of, of my work at Google right now has mostly to do with uh, trying again, as I said, like, you know, to advance the overall advertising industry understanding of sustainability. Mm. So specifically in this case, I sit uh, at the advertising business group for the MENA region, mm -hmm. um, where I try to advance sustainability marketing practices among our members. Mm. This has almost like, you know, two areas of work. The first has to do more about, hey, can we harness the power of marketing mm. to actually, you know, shape mindset? How can we make sure that customers understand what sustainability truly is mm -hmm. and how brands utilize the power of marketing to, uh, uh, you know, deliver messages that are important mm -hmm. to support sustainability journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is coupled with another piece of work uh, that to me is extremely important that has to do, how do we avoid greenwashing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So greenwashing is this practice of, you know, putting a green leaf on a product or saying this is sustainably sourced. Mm. You know, it's very interesting, but still very fluffy claims right. that make clients think or make a customer believe, oh, you know, I'm doing something good by buying this and it's green, mm. but actually like, you know, you're driving uh, uh, even, e even more environmental uh, issues because, you know, a person at that point believes that, you know, they're buying a good product, mm. but in fact it is not. Great. So how can we, mm. so I'm really trying to work at an industry level to, uh, again, create some of good practices to avoid greenwash. Mm. Well said. Great response. Thank you. The other question that I had, Bruno, was that in most organizations that are looking for, you know, sustainable strategies, there's also a concern on how do we handle economic growth? So how do you recommend that? you know, organizations balance economic growth with the need for sustainability? Yeah, thank you for this question. I, I generally believe this is like, you know, the usual $1 million question. Like, you know, how can I, you know, achieve economic growth while, uh, you know, avoiding all of the environmental and social issues yeah. uh, that, that we've been experiencing? Mm -hmm. um, I believe that... It, it, this really begins at the foundational level of how we approach the design mm. of products and services. Right. Now, if you think about it, like, you know, historically, economic expansions, as, as, as you said it in your question, like, you know, has often come at the expense of the planet. I believe it doesn't have to be this way, mm. right? Uh, if you think that approximately 80% of environmental and social issues mm -hmm. come from initial design choices, mm. So what this means is that if, if, if you know this, you know, these realizations opens up, opens up a bit of a, a transformative opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is to design products and services that, again, by design, they eliminate waste, they right. eliminate toxicity, they eliminate pollution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this really ties into the concepts of what we call the circular economy, mm -hmm. uh, which means that we need to create systems that again, maximize the longevity, the reuse, the value of the resources, mm. right? Um, um, so, so again, like, you know, this design approach really allows to reimagine growth in a way that, again, supports and regenerates the living system mm. rather than depleting them. So again, like, you know, if you focus on regenerative design from the onset, mm -hmm. again, like, you know, you shift immediately that question from, how can my company's growth be less harmful mm. to a question that is, how can our growth actually contribute to the regeneration mm. uh, you know, of the planet and society's well-being? Mm. Fascinating. Thank you. Of course. You, know, you also must be working with many, many different organizations. What are some innovative technologies or solutions you have seen that have the potential to revolutionize sustainability when it comes to business? Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, 
it's it's difficult to find you know silver bullet solutions nowadays, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we obviously need to look around and we need to look everywhere. Yeah. To me, you know what uh, what I like to say is, why don't we think about innovation by looking at nature? Mm -hmm. Yeah, nature has been around for four billion years on this planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it has evolved. Uh, you know, utilizing local resources, mm -hmm. uh, flowing energy, and 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 circulating elements. Right. Yeah. Uh, we tend to like you know the the, the economic uh, model of of humanity tends to use a lot of electricity, lots of energy, high temperatures. Right. right. But then right. look complex elements. But if you look at nature, that's not what it does. Mm. So to me, the most important innovation, uh, it's 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 something that is called biomimicry. Mm -hmm. Right, so biomimicry means, hey, how can we actually uh, copy? Yeah, how can we actually look at the best engineer that mm -hmm. we have in this planet that is, you know, Mother Nature, mm -hmm. and how can we make sure that our products and services right. actually are designed, you know, on on natural principles? And I want to give you one example. I came mm -hmm. across this company that is called Spintex. Mm -hmm. uh, Spintex came up with a whole different new. Uh, material for clothing that really understand how uh, spiders, for example, create their webs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so listen to this because because I find it extremely interesting. So, mm -hmm. uh, so spider silk, for example, is considered one of the strongest biological materials. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, so a spider's web can capture an insect, uh, you know, as strong as a human-made net the size of a football field could mm. trap an airplane. Mm. So imagine, imagine that, imagine mm. how strong. So, so when this company, Spintex, recognized the potential of the spider silk, they really wanted to replicate it and understood how spiders do. And mm. again, spiders, if you think about it, you know, they don't have machinery, they don't increase temperatures, they don't, they don't go completely crazy on utilizing a lot mm. of elements. What they do, they utilize their body for that. Uh, now, I don't want to get, you know, too technical yeah. and too yeah. into this, but like, you know, the idea is that, like, you know, the way that, for example, the spider creates the silk is that it keeps, it keeps, you know, the material as a liquid in their, in their body. And then when it goes out, they use, they squeeze it in a way that they change the composition of the protein okay. from liquid. It becomes solid. Mm. So what the Spintex did, they really studied what spiders do. And they say, hey, this is a silk fiber that is produced with very low energy mm -hmm. and simple materials, exactly how spiders would do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, great this is just, you know, yeah, no, again, it's is... one, the, the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, what a great example. Thank you. Of course. My next question, Bruno, and when I was reading about you and preparing for this conversation, you're also doing work in the area of sustainable farming and waste management. Uh, how have you overcome some of the key challenges in agriculture? Um, yeah, thank you for this question. So I, I, I worked specifically with, with one company on the concept of, uh, of agriculture. And, and again, like, you know, I was telling you, like, you know, I, I was raised on a farm. So, mm. so to me, the concept of how can we make agriculture regenerative, mm. uh, is really top of mind. Um, and, and, and again, like, you know, one of the challenges that you are, uh, that you're asking me is, um, we have become extremely specialized. Mm. Yeah. So you have, for example, farms that produce cotton for six months of the year. Right. And then the other six months, they don't produce anything. Mm. And then you have other farms, for example, that, you know, they raise uh, uh, chickens. Mm. Yeah. So this, this heavy specialization, have, like, you know, what, what, like, you know, also segregated, uh, uh, you know, on the one side, the crops, on the other side, the mm. animals. Right. So the idea is, again, how does nature do this? Nature doesn't segregate. Nature mm. keeps on integrating different things. Right, right. So this means, hey, can I have, for example, a farm that integrates both, you know, growing the crops mm. and at the same time also, you know, different crops? You know, you, you, you could, for example, like, you know, plant uh, cotton and at the same time, uh, uh, you know, you, 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 could, uh, you could plant, uh, you know, something else. You know, mm. one 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 line could be cotton, the other line could be another crop. Mm. Yeah. Or how can I integrate, for example, animals? Um, uh, some of the farms, for example, that 
I visited recently, you know, at the end of the harvest, they let animals come in and graze whatever is left. Mm. So that they get, you know, you utilize animals in a way that are fully integrated in the mm. farm. Mm. So, so going back to your question, what is the challenge? The challenge almost is, is the curse of our, uh, you know, um, efficiency mindset, which is the more I, the more I segregate, the more I become specialized. But again, the more than I underutilize resources. And again, like, you know, nature integrates rather than segregates, right. which means, hey, how can I actually break down this challenge of, mm -hmm. of, of specialization? And almost can we go back like, you know, hundreds of years and, and look how actually agriculture was done. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's well uh, said. that's well said. So we don't have time for two more questions for you. Yeah. My next question is that, you know, what would you say is uh, one of the most unexpected lessons you have learned about sustainability while working with so many people? Yeah. Uh, so, so I would say, I would say, uh, I don't know if it's truly unexpected, but to me, there are two two main lessons that I think. Yeah. Um, that that are with me. The first one is that again, as simple as it can sound, mm. but one of the most humbling lesson I learned is that it's impossible to achieve infinite economic growth mm. on a finite planet. Mm. Yeah. So if you look at our planet, mm. it's it's beautiful sphere, you know, going around the sun. Yeah. Again, as big as it can be and as big as it can feel to us, mm. it's finite. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So, so our economy now has grew so much that the resources that's that you know from from mother earth mm. and the size of our waste mm. are becoming so small that you know like the world has become small for us mm. yeah so so again like you know it's to, to me it was quite unexpected and and again because probably i was a bit naive you know i grew up on this little farm in the north of italy so i would never expect the human enterprise to reach to a level to actually be too big to be supported by our planet. So, mm. so that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, and and uh, and I hope I'm not going to be too controversial here, but mm -hmm. I think technology actually will save us. Mm. Uh, if you look at you know technological advancements, they helped humans, civilization perhaps to mm. progress, mm. but again at the expense of other species and right. nature, right? Um, uh, technology, for example. Uh, you know, after the Second World War, what we call the Green Revolution, you know, so all of the chemicals that was utilized were utilized and still today for, uh, you know, fertilizers, pesticides that, yes, are good because they increased agricultural production. Mm. But, it, you know, pesticides are killing uh, lots of insects, lots of species that we need today to pollinate our products, mm. uh, you know, our farms. Uh, or if you think about like, you know, overloading soils from fertilizers mm -hmm. and now you know, they're creating dead zones in oceans. Um, so, so again, there is this concept of, yeah, technology seems to be like, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the big solution. Mm -hmm. However, there is a feedback loop somewhere else. Yeah. There is a side effect somewhere else, you know, mm -hmm. like we always think linearly, but, but it's never like that. Like, you know, if, you know, if A impacts B, the question is how does B impacts B? Yeah. Uh, sorry, how does B impacts A mm -hmm. on the other way around, right? So, um, so yeah, two things. One is we work, we we're on a finite planet, so infinite growth is not possible. Mm -hmm. The second one is think about feedback loops because again, mm -hmm. like you know, technology cannot be the only solution. Yeah, very interesting. And on that note, uh, Bruno and your two wonderful lessons: it is impossible to achieve infinite growth. Growth, so don't have such expectations and second you said don't you don't think technology will be the only solution to save us think of feedback loops uh thank you so much bruno for speaking to me about your own amazing journey thank you for talking to me about sustainability and so many different aspects of sustainability that we cover today uh thank you for talking to me about the way you and your role from google are supporting so many small and medium enterprises to be able to start start off on their journey on sustainability. Thank you for what you're doing for the planet. Thank you for speaking to me and good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to the brand called You Video Cast and Podcast. A platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.